why did you choose me? Anybody ever ask that question? Why did you choose me? What did you see in me? You know, here's the thing is, is, is I, I talk to so many people and um, I, I talk to children of God that just feel, feel like their, their time is over. They, they feel like, they feel like they've, 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 um, they've been used up. They feel like they've uh, exhausted everything that they have for God and that, uh, that, that there's nothing else that they have to offer. You know, and generally I'll ask these individuals that make these statements, I'll say, uh, are you still breathing? And uh, obviously they say, yes, they're still breathing because they're having a conversation with me. And when they say, yes, I'm still breathing, and I'll tell them, if you've got breath in your, in your lungs, there's still something for you to do. So get off of the sideline, get on the field, and start playing the game. They're, they're, the churches, listen, uh, churches are just full of sideline Christians. You, you, do you all understand what I'm talking about, sideline Christians? Ch churches are full of Christians that are just sitting the bench. They're content with sitting the bench, content with just being a part of the service. And, and, and the thing is, is we need to take a stand as children of God. We need to stand up and we need to make this statement, don't write me off. Amen. Because God still has something for me to do. Listen, I want to encourage you today, whoever you are, wherever you are, whoever's listening down the road, I want you to understand that you are not done. You are not done. God is not done with you. I, I told Tina um, the other day, uh, we were having a conversation through text messages. We text a lot because she, she works in the hospital, so it's not like she just walks around with a cell phone in her hand. So we communicate a lot through text messaging, and I made a statement to her. I said, I'm praying for a certain level of commitment. I, I see a certain level of commitment in people, and I see a certain level of commitment and a desire to honor God with their gifts and with their talents or their abilities. And I said, you know what? That's what I'm going to begin to pray for. I'm going to begin to pray for all of us, including myself, to come up to that level of commitment to God, that we would have that next level commitment to honor God with our life. You don't have to be right here in this position to honor God with your life. So many people say, well, ah, you know, I'm just, I'm just little old me. I'm just this or I'm just that. No, you are a child of God and God put a purpose in you. Even in you, Jay, God put a purpose in you. <laughs> and that's good. That's good because you know what? A lot of people, they just, they just sit there and they say, well, I'm just waiting on God to talk to me. I'm just waiting on God to say something to me. God has been saying stuff to you your whole life. You got to figure out how to hear we need to figure out how to hear what God is saying because God speaks in so many different ways to me. I was sharing with Carrie here just the other day. I said, you know what? I said, I'll be praying for something. I'll be asking God an, uh, a question. I'll be wanting to know something from God, and I don't hear nothing. I don't hear this audible voice. I don't hear, Michael, turn to Acts chapter blah, blah, blah. I don't hear that. But the next thing I know, I'm watching YouTube and a song comes on and the lyrics in that song are the answer to what I was praying. And God speaks in that way. I'm not saying he's going to speak to you through a song. Maybe he will. He does a lot. There's a lot of times when I'm up here and I'm worshiping and I'm praying and I'm seeking God as the team is leading us into the throne room. And then they began to sing a song about something that I'm down here praying for. And I didn't tell them what that was. I didn't tell the team, hey, I'm going to come up and I'm going to be praying this prayer. I want y'all to sing this song so that I can hear my answer. I don't tell them that. I give them a general direction as to what God is speaking to me. And then, and then Veronica puts a list together and the team comes together and they collaborate or whatever you call it about that situation, about what God is speaking into me to try to keep the entire service focused in that direction. 
But I'm just telling you now that God speaks in so many different ways. It doesn't have to be an audible voice, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be a scripture. It can be a person. It can be your neighbor that, that you run into at your mailbox or anything. God speaks in so many different ways. I want us to look at this. Don't write me off. This is what I was hearing this week. Don't write me off. Turn to Galatians chapter 5 in verse 1. In the New Living Translation, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. There, there's going to be several things that I'm going to point out in this passage of Scripture today from Galatians 5. But how many people remember back in the 1980s, there was, a, there was a commercial on television back in the 1980s, and it was a, a little old lady that was laying on the floor in her bathroom or in her kitchen or wherever she was, and she says, help, I have fallen, and I can't get up. And I can't get up. Y'all remember that? Yep. Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. I'm here to bring you a message today to tell you to stop kicking me when I'm down. Y'all didn't hear me. We need to stop kicking one another when we fall. And I'm not talking about sin today. You say, well, wait a minute, aren't you supposed to talk about sin? You're the, you're the preacher. You're supposed to talk about sin. I agree, sin is a very real issue. I agree. I don't think sin is talked about near enough in church anymore. I think we sugarcoat things way too much in the body of Christ today. And we try to make people feel good about themselves. And I think we should feel good about ourselves. But I also think that we need to know about sin because sin is what sent my Savior to the cross. Amen. And sin has been dealt with. And I think a lot of people sweep sin under the rug. But that's not why I'm here today. Today I want you to know that there are times, and this is what I was praying before the service started, I was praying that, you know what, sometimes we fall and it's not the result of sin. And that's what, that's what Proverbs 24, 16 talks about. A lot of people don't understand that and they don't realize that. But what he's talking about in Proverbs chapter 24 is not people that fall into sin, but sometimes we fall into calamity as a result of things in life. How many people know that we live life? We live a real life. We, we experience real things in our life. We go through things in our life. We experience hard times. We experience struggles and troubles and, and, all, and some Sometimes we are what, what we would call collateral damage. We, 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 are, we experience things as a result of what someone else is doing. And it doesn't mean that we're a bad person, and it doesn't mean that we're doing something that's in all-out sin against God. And the Word of God very plainly tells us in so many words. I, I just paraphrase. Don't kick a brother or a sister when they're down because you have no idea why they're down. You have no idea what they're going through. What we should be doing is going to them and offering help to them. And the scripture actually says that a godly person is going to fall seven times. Does that mean that on the eighth time they're going to hell? No, he, that, that number that is used there in Proverbs chapter 24, it, it's, it's an indefinite number. He's just saying, you know what? We trip and fall. When we're, walk, when we're learning how to walk, do you know how many times my grandchildren fall? I, I, was chasing, I was chasing the youngest one around the ballpark yesterday. For over an hour... I was just following him around the ballpark because he don't want to stand still. He wants to move around. And everywhere he walks, he's clumsy. He trips over everything. And you say, well, what do you expect? He's a year old. He's a year old, right? Is that how old he is, a year old? Is he two? I don't know how old he is. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but he trips over everything because he doesn't look. 
you know, as an adult, I'm looking for hazards. Not only am I walking and I'm looking around, I'm also looking to make sure I don't trip over nothing, right? He don't do that. He just tripping over sidewalks, tripping over rocks, running into people, running into poles. Tried climbing a dirt pile, ended up falling over backwards and crying. And I'm like, well, what'd you expect? You climbed a dirt pile. <laughs> Sometimes you got to let them fall so they can learn. But anyway, we don't need to be kicking each other while we're down. And, and listen to what he says here in this, in this passage, though. In Galatians 5, he's telling us, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. How many believe, people believe that Christ has truly set us free? I, I, believe, I believe he has truly set us free. And listen to what he says here, though. But don't get it entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So many people, and, and here's the thing is, we all know what a yoke is. I, I preached about a yoke. Charles preached about a yoke many times. But he's saying here, this, do not get entangled again in that yoke. A yoke doesn't necessarily mean sin. A yoke, listen, when you, when you yoke two oxen up, they are yoked to work, not to do something wrong. Just because you're yoked up to something doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. So many, I, I, I get so sick and tired of people always beating other people over the head with that sin thing just because you're yoked up to something. And, and listen, I've probably done the same thing. I probably have done that same thing, hitting people with the Bible, telling them that they're yoked up to something and they need to break that yoke off. There. What if it's a, you want me to break the yoke to my family? But at the same time, we need to understand that my family also can keep me away from serving God. So I have to be careful how I am yoked. You understand? Just because you're yoked to something doesn't mean you're yoked to sin. But just like a, a two oxen or two horses or two mules or whatever they are, are yoked together, they might be yoked together doing something good, but that something good could take them away from God. So we have to understand what we're being yoked to. We've got to understand the yoke that is, that is driving our life. So I, I go back to this commercial because I, I get a kick out of this commercial. Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Anybody ever fallen and they couldn't get up? <laughs> I'm not an old man and I have fallen and I couldn't get up. Knocked the breath out of me. I, I, can, I can remember some times when I, I remember falling off the house one time. I was trimming some limbs and I fell off the roof knocked the wind out of me and I felt like that little old lady help I've fallen and I can't get up I just need some help I don't need someone to come over and say you're such an idiot you're dumb why were you on that roof I, listen I was doing something that I was doing a little job at my son's house on Saturday and it, it made me think about that and I even called myself an idiot because I had a uh, I had a a two-step step stool with a five gallon bucket of paint on the top of the stool and I was standing on the top of the bucket painting something up at the top and I was thinking to myself you're a dummy because it, it wasn't hard getting up there it was hard getting down because as I was trying to transfer my weight to come down you know the bucket is starting to do like this and there wasn't nobody at home but me and the dogs <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I would have failed, they would have licked you. They would have just come and licked my wounds. <laughs> I, I just want you to know here today, and this is the message that I want you to hear. And I, I'm not going to try and, and take two and a half hours to do this today, but I just want you to know that just because you're going through something in your life, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a result of sin. That's right. 
And I want you to know that we need to be helping one another. We need to be coming to the aid. You're going to see this in just a minute. We need to be coming to the aid of one another and encouraging one another. And sometimes picking one another up and helping each other. Turn to Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 7, this is a story, as you're turning there, uh, I'll just kind of give you a little front, is that Paul is on his third missionary journey. And, he, and actually, he's coming, he's coming to this place, in, uh, or he's, he's in this place in, in Troas, and, and he's about to be leaving Troas and probably will never be there. In fact, we know he'll never be there again. These people don't know that. Paul does. Paul knows that he will probably never be there again. And so he wants to encourage them and give them hope. And so what we see here in, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. I remind you of him. <laughs> That amazes me. That, and, and it doesn't say when they started. I mean, it doesn't say that, you know, it was a, a 9 a.m. service or, 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 you know, did they start around noontime or what. It, it, just, it just, really, it just says, and this is the New Living Translation, it just says that Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, in other words, he understood, I, I'm not going to be back, and these people are never going to see my face again. I want, to, uh, I want them to have encouragement. He says, he kept talking until midnight. And the upstairs room where they met was lighted with many flickering lamps. Now, I just want to stop right there just for a minute because that really ties to the message that I spoke last week. How many people heard the, the message that I spoke last week about the oil, oil. about the necessity of having the oil in your lamp? So many people try to go through life without oil. And when they don't have oil, they don't have light. When they don't have oil, they don't have direction. When they don't have oil, they don't have His presence. And, and I, I'm just encouraged by this because... This upstairs room or this upper room where they met was lighted with many flickering lamps. Do you know why that he preached until midnight and there wasn't anybody complaining about how long that he was preaching? Because there was oil in the room. In other words, there was a presence that was in the room that had a desire for more. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for such an overflow of oil in the room that there is going to be an overwhelming desire and we're not going to want to leave. That's what we're seeing happen at these college campuses is that there's such a saturation of oil in that place. Nobody wants to leave. Nobody wants to leave. And it's not about a show. It's not about a light show or a smoke machine or anything like that. It's about the oil, the presence of God. That's it. And nobody wants to leave. I want that. I want that. I want that for us. I want that for our community. I want that for our region, our state. I want that for the United States. I want that for the world. I want us to desire His presence, just like these people were in this upper room. It doesn't say that these were all disciples. It doesn't say they were all the businessmen. It was college people. It just said it was people that had oil, and they wanted to hear what Paul was saying. I heard a preacher say, I heard a preacher say one time, there's a, you know, Paul preaching till midnight, and actually you're going to see he preaches even longer than that. But there's a real fine line between a good message and a hostage situation. <laughs> uh -oh. 
Sometimes I wonder if I've got y'all wrapped up in a hostage situation, but that's okay. <laughs> but listen to this. It says that Paul spoke on and on. He just went on <laughs> and on. And a young man named Eutychus sitting on a windowsill. Now this is interesting because a windowsill represents a divide between where God is and the things of the world. The, okay, so again, this is not about sin because we all do things in the world. We all participate in things of the world. We, we go and we do and we enjoy entertainment and things like that. And it doesn't mean that we're in sin. It just means that it's the things of the world. And there's this, there's this window, just like this thing right here. There's this, there's this window that, that Eutychus was sitting in. And he was probably kicked back. You know, he was probably easy. <laughs> he was probably chilling in the windowsill. One side of him was enjoying the oil. Enjoying the presence of God. Enjoying the, the things of God. I've got impeccable balance. Enjoying the things of God on one side, but also enjoying the things of the world on the other. A lot of us find ourselves in the windowsill. Again, it's not about things, it's not about sinning. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that things of the world begin to take dominance over the things that are going on in the room in the presence of God, the oil. And although there were many flickering lamps, in other words there was a, a powerful presence in the room, especially considering that Paul had preached to this point up till midnight. But because Eutychus was in the windowsill, in other words, he had one leg in the world and one leg in the, let's just for the sake of a better word, use the word church. He was straddling the fence, in other words, the windowsill between the world and the presence of God. Now listen, I want the presence of God and I also want to enjoy my life. I want to enjoy my, my kids. I want to enjoy my grandkids and I want to do things. And, and you know, yesterday was a full day for us. Tina went to Orange to watch our granddaughter play softball. I went to men's breakfast. From there we met back up. We drove north to a birthday party. From there we came back south to a baseball event. Finally at dark we made it home. Praise Jesus. We enjoyed the whole day. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But do those things become more priority than the things of God? That's all, that's all I'm saying. And, and here's the thing is, look what happens here. It says that as Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, become very drowsy. And this is what happens in the church today, is that the things in the world make us tired of the things of God. Uh, listen, I, I know that's hard to believe. I know it's hard for us to understand how something in the world would make us drowsy of the things of God. But there's such a level of entertainment and such a level of, of, of constant drawing from us that we are not allowing us to, to get fully immersed in the things of God and get refueled like we need to. And here's, here's what he's saying here. It says that Eutychus sitting on the windowsill became very drowsy and finally he just fell asleep and he dropped three stories to his death below. That's key information that most people read right over is that he fell to his death. Look at, uh, go, is that, okay, New Living Translation. He fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Don't write me off. 
This is the title of my message, Don't Write Me Off. Did Eutychus fall because he was engaged in something sinful or wrong? Does it mention that in Scripture? Does it mention in Scripture that, that Eutychus was focused on something that was not of God? Participating in anything that was not of God. It just said he was in the windowsill. That can mean anything. And so often, Christians, we focus on what did that person do? They fail. What did they do? They don't deserve the glory of God. No, this is what I hear. This is what I hear. They don't deserve the glory of God. They fail to their death. If they were focused on what God was doing, they wouldn't have failed. Those are the things that I hear. And I'm like, are you serious? What happened to help your brother? What happened to pray? What happened to restoration? Well, what happened to an, un, uh, an unlimited amount of mercy? What happened to his mercy being renewed every day? What happened to all of that? We just throw that out of the window? We just say, well, that person has fallen eight times. They don't deserve it. No, the Scripture says that it will happen over and over and over. And it doesn't matter how many times a person falls, they still deserve the glory of God. They still deserve the mercy of God. They still deserve forgiveness. So it's not God that's turning his back. It's us. People turn their back on people. And that's not the heart of God. Because in the very next verse of Scripture, it says that Paul went down and bent over him and took him into his arms and hollered out, Don't worry, he's alive. But it said in the previous verse that he fell to his death. Don't write me off. We need to hear this. Don't write me off. So many people fall and we write them off. So many people fall in the church. They fall out of what we say. They fall out of grace. And then we write them off. Well, they're no good anymore. They're no good to the body of Christ no more. That ain't what the Scripture says. It says that the gifts and the anointings of God are without repentance. That means He doesn't revoke them. He doesn't take them back. He is the God of restoration. He is the God of rebuilding. You can look in any people. You, you know, I hear, this is another thing that I hear. Oh, well, that's a, that's a biblical character. That's a person in the Bible. Well, aren't you a biblical character too? Yes. Yes, you are. I am too. And God has picked me up out of the mud numerous times. Numerous times. And he'll still do it until I give up all the breath that I have in my lungs. He's still going to love me. Regardless of what I'm going through. Regardless of the decisions that I'm making. And that's not a license to go out and do whatever I want to do. I should constantly be seeking to glorify God. I should constantly be wanting to give him everything that I've got. But you know what? Sometimes I trip and I fall. Sometimes I'm not focused on the direction. Sometimes I've got my, my focus is on something else, and then I trip, and I fall. And the Lord says that we need to be going to those people and helping them back up and get them back on track. That's what the Word of God says. That's the, rest, the restoring God that I serve. And so Paul was so excited, and so were all of the other people that were there, that they saw this kid fall out of the window, and they saw him dead. Can you imagine? They're probably like, yep. Hey, he, Paul had to go down three flights of stairs. Three, three flights of stairs. So he was down there for a little bit, right? Everybody hanging out the window. Yeah. He did. He ain't moving. He's down. Right? How many people have done that to you? I, I have been so down in my life, and, and this, is, this is the peanut bat gallery of, of Christians. Yep. He ain't preaching no more. He's finally out. 
He's down. I love it. I saw a clip the other day. Oh, how many... How many, how many Hulkamaniacs we got in here? We got some Hulkamaniacs up in here? Listen, I can remember. RJ, come here. I need your help. Come here. Oh, my God. I love this. <clears throat> I want you to put me in a chokehold. Come on. Put me in a chokehold. Come on. Right? And this, this was the Hulk, right? We're almost down. Come on, like you're taking me down. <laughs> but then all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> ah, right? <laughs> Hulkamaniacs. Oh, People want to count you out. Uh, they want to count you out. But we, <laughs> we, need, we, we need to act like the Hulk. Not act, but that's how we need to be in our life. When the enemy's got you in a chokehold, when the enemy's trying to take you down, you need to reach in and you need to reach up. Don't count me out. Don't count me out. Just because I'm down doesn't mean I'm no good anymore. You might have me close to tapping out, but then I realize and I remember that my strength comes from the Lord. My strength doesn't come from how much understanding or knowledge that I have, although that is good to have knowledge. My strength doesn't come from a book. My strength comes from God. My understanding comes from Him. My provision comes from Him. My, my wisdom, everything about me comes from him. And so even though I'm down, don't count me out. And that's why we as brothers and sisters in Christ need to be running to those that fall out of the window and stop counting them out and start helping them up. That way we can proclaim he or she is not dead. And then go back into the room. Go back into the room like Paul did. It says, then Paul went back upstairs and shared the Lord's Supper and ate together and continued talking to them until dawn. Wow. Now, I don't know, y'all. I've been in some really long church services before. <laughs> But I'm sure at midnight, they were like, surely he's about to close. <laughs> but this started happening. This started happening. And then this happened. <laughs> you Hulkamaniacs know what I'm talking about. <laughs> When he ripped that shirt, it was on. <laughs> this shirt costs too much to do that. But anyway, <laughs> it says that Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. And meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. They were full of joy. I'm just here to tell you, don't count me out. Don't count yourself out. Don't count out your loved ones. Let me tell you something. When you get beat down, you need to start remembering what the Word tells us in John chapter 8 when He says that the truth will set you free. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. When He says in John 8, 36, when He says that the Son, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. So just because you're tied up, just because you're bound down, doesn't mean that you're out. Don't count me out. If I fall out of the window, don't come down and check my pulse. Come down and pick me up. If I fall out of the window, don't come down and kick me. Pick me up and set me back on my feet. And that's what we need to start thinking about. We need to, we need to start thinking about just because someone is sitting in a window doesn't mean that they're a dreamer. Doesn't mean that all they do is think about worldly things. Sometimes people are sitting in the windows. I like to look out the window from time to time. I remember when I used to, I don't want to call it babysit, uh, adult sit Charles. 
I remember when <laughs> Charles would stand at the window and just stand and stare out the window. Where's my wife? Where's my wife? Sometimes I like to look out the window. It doesn't mean that I'm desiring sin. You love to play golf. Just because you're on the golf course doesn't mean that you don't love God. Y'all do ballpark stuff. Just because you're at the ballpark doesn't mean you don't love God. Listen, I've had this mentality. I, I've had this, and God has really, God has really set this in me to, to stop looking at people when people are not there, when people are, are doing other things, that it doesn't mean that they're sinning. And just because someone gets caught up in something doesn't mean that they were the partaker of it. They might be collateral. They might be going through calamity because of something someone else has done. Stop kicking. Stop doing that. And start helping people up. Start picking people up. And start setting them back on the right path. And encouraging them. And start preaching till dawn. There's a deeper message in that than y'all are hearing. But that's okay. Take that message home with you today. And, and, and ask God to let that set into your spirit. What does that mean? To preach till midnight and preach till dawn. What does that mean? What does it mean about those flickering lamps? I'm just telling you. Desire the oil of God. And you won't worry about a time schedule. Start desiring the oil of God. And you won't worry about what everybody else is doing. Because when you've got the oil of God, and when you're desiring the oil of God, all you're going to care about is whether or not you're wet from the oil or not. Not, not anything else.